Hello and welcome back to the point and click devlog, an ongoing series in which we're combining persistence with effort and using it on every object in the room. This week we're going to be taking a look at the anatomy of a point and click game puzzle and using that to figure out how best to design our own. We've got a lot to cover off so without further ado, here we go. So I've had a fair bit of interest in my process for designing and mapping out puzzles as discussed in episode one of this devlog, so I thought I'd take this video to dive a little deeper into the structure of point and click puzzles, how they work, what similarities run through them, and ultimately how to make your own. I just wanna say right at the top that Mark Brown also has an excellent video on this subject, which I've linked in the description, that you should definitely watch when you're done here. But while there is some healthy crossover between his video and this one, I'm going to take this in a slightly different direction in the back half by focusing more on the pragmatics of building out your own puzzles rather than on the ways to help avoid so-called moon logic. So as mentioned previously, I have most of my own game's puzzles uh, nailed down now, mapped out across two documents. That's my overall game design doc um, and this monster flowchart made using Lucidchart. The main structure for these came off the back of research into what the industry commonly calls puzzle dependency charts. As a quick reminder, this is a graph made by starting at the end of each puzzle or group of puzzles, namely your character's goal, and working backwards, adding complications and requirements to complete each puzzle. That's kind of the how, but before we get into that properly, we also need to look at the what namely what the puzzles in these games are actually about on their most basic level. To that end, I did some digging to see what people much smarter than me have said on the subject, and I found this great blog by Size 5 Games' Dan Marshall from 2014 about the three main building blocks of point-and-click puzzles. Doors, keys, and signposts. By the nature of the beast, there's a door, Dan says, a blockage something that's stopping the player getting from A to B. Doors are, by and large, pretty dull. The good news is that door is just a metaphor for obstruction. They can be anything, and the obstruction doesn't have to be literal. A fire, a maniac with an axe, an anthropomorphized pair of shoes with a bad attitude. And just as your door can be anything, like a fire, for example, your key can be as crazy as you like too. Water and bucket are boring items, Dan explains. You can do anything in adventure games, so let's make them more interesting. If it's a thing I can get my hands on in real life, it often makes sense to change it for something more outlandish and interesting. What's better than water? Piss. What's more interesting than a bucket? A hollowed out owl carcass. Let's go with those. Use owl carcass filled with piss on fire. Now that's a puzzle solution. And that's great, especially if you're making a wacky Day of the Tentacle style game. But given that it's not an immediately obvious common sense solution, the last part of the pie, signposting, becomes just as important as anything else. In other words, have your characters say things and move in such a way as to point the player in the right direction. Your elephant needs to be animated in a way that looks like he's queuing for the toilet, legs crossed, sweating. If you look at him, the character needs to say something along the lines of, man, that elephant needs a piss. If I could capture it somehow, I'd have a bountiful supply of water-like liquid. Signpost everything, and as long as the puzzle makes sense within the batshit crazy context of your game world, it's all gravy. Of course, if your game's set in a more down-to-earth environment, sometimes using water on fire is fine, so long as there's still some kind of puzzling to be done. And that realisation got me thinking about how most point and click games open, because while the door and key metaphor runs true for most of these games, a lot of them quite literally begin with you trapped in a room needing to open a door. And it's obvious why when you think about it. That single room opening structure acts as a simple enclosed space to help teach the player the ropes without becoming overwhelmed. You get to learn about picking up objects, combining them and using them, ultimately to unlock that door. And before you then let your doors and keys become wildly more metaphorical in nature, this setup helps keep things nice and simple. 
we're all familiar with locked doors, we all know they want opening. Let's look at an example. The opening of Broken Sword 2 sees our hero George Stobart tied up in a room with a huge spider and a fire in front of the only exit. Killing the spider, untying yourself and putting out the fire are the three metaphorical keys you need to unlock the literal door. So how's it done? In brief, examine the bookshelf to learn that it's being supported by a brick. Kick the brick and the bookshelf takes care of the spider. That also reveals a bit of metal you can use to free yourself. You're effectively learning a few key things here. One, that you can learn more about objects by inspecting them. Two, is that characters, George in this example, will signpost new, useful information. And three, how to physically interact with objects in the room. From there, we examine inventory items to gain new ones, pick up a few objects, use them to gain access to cabinets and other objects, and finally combine two items, a water siphon and a canister, to create a makeshift fire extinguisher. And that's job done. It's a tight little sequence that acts as a perfect tutorial and vertical slice for what you'll be doing in the rest of the game. And because of that, I think we should have a go at deconstructing it. I want to use this opening to show what I mean when I say puzzle dependency chart and how they naturally build out from the solution backwards. So let's open up trusty old lucid chart and have a go at doing just that. So first up, let's use some kind of color coding system to keep ourselves focused. I'm going to use white blocks for general actions, yellow for objects, orange for combined objects, black for our end goal, grey for our scene setup and blue for our sub goals. I'm going to put two blocks in first, the scene setup and the end goal. Ultimately we need to escape the room but our sub goals help us get there. Kill the spider, untie yourself and put out the fire. So let's put those in first. Now I know I said we'd work from the end backwards but because this scene starts linear and ends up more complex I'm just going to handle those two initial sub goals first. How do we kill the spider? How about kicking that support block? That's too simple as is though, so how about we need to inspect it first? That's adding a complexity in a nutshell. Same applies for freeing yourself. Use the metal handle, but only after you've inspected it. Okay, so now we have this gulf between George being untied and putting out that fire, and we need some puzzle gameplay, ideally more complex puzzle gameplay, to fill it with. So let's move backwards. If we're at Revolution Software, we decide that we want to use a water siphon on that fire, but we don't want it to be readily available, so let's make that a combined object from two separate parts, the siphon itself and a working gas cylinder. And to keep this opening a bit streamlined, let's make one of those things readily available, so in this case the siphon can be picked up as soon as you're untied. Okay. Now let's get making the intact cylinder more complex by requiring two puzzle parts to get it. Firstly, let's put it in a locked cabinet. We need something sharp to jimmy it open. So how about the blow dart from the opening sequence? Get dart, use dart, the cabinet opens. We still don't want things to be that straightforward though. In this case, Revolution decided that opening the cabinet would break one cylinder causing an explosion that would make the remaining one too hot to touch. So we need to pick it up with some kind of protective material. This is the 90s, so hey, why not some of Nico's sexy underwear? So let's make use that on cylinder our action. We want one more complexity in there though, so let's make getting the underwear also teach the player that inspecting inventory items can lead to brand new items. So let's put them in her bag and make inspect bag that action. Now, if we hook those all up, you can see that from the point of being untied, you effectively have three different paths to go down that combine to solve the larger sub goal. Each one starting with a readily available object. You can pick up the bag, the dart and the siphon, but the two former objects eventually serve the same mini puzzle. So there you go, that's one puzzle dependency chart and a great one for opening a game with because it's fairly linear while still running through the basics. Disclaimer, there are actually a few more objects to collect in that room that you'll need for the next one but I figured it was best to keep things simple for the purpose of this video. 
As your game opens up and becomes more complex, you might want to add more and more codependencies. That means common items that serve more than one puzzle, or are used across acts, or a larger overarching goal that needs lots of smaller puzzles to solve it first. Anyway, I hope that was a useful little experiment for anyone embarking on this journey themselves, and I hope it's provided some good food for thought. As I've mentioned before, none of this is my invention. It's how the very best in the industry created the flow for their point and click adventures, which is why it's the structure I've used to help me create three, hopefully robust acts for mine. Beyond that, I think having everything mapped out like this allows you to see at a glance all your items and combined items, view the overall complexity and pacing, uh, and lets the whole thing act as a kind of walkthrough for your game, which to me makes this a pretty invaluable practice. Anyway, that's me for another episode, uh, so thanks for watching. I'm still cracking on with drawing backdrops for my own game, so I'm going to get back to that now. Let me know how you're getting on with your projects or what you're playing in the comments, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.